Good morning and welcome to Little Chapel on the Boardwalks online worship service. If this is your first time joining us, we extend you an extra special welcome and hope you'll consider us consider visiting us in person once our stay at home order has been lifted. And to those of you who are members of Little Chapel, please know that you continue to be in my prayers and I hope all are staying well during this time. This morning we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion, so if you haven't yet prepared your elements, maybe while we are singing the opening hymn, you'll want to go and find something to use for bread and juice. Remember, what you use isn't important, as they are simply symbols of the body and blood of Christ. Now for those of you who might be thinking, well, I will sneak away while Pat's preaching and get the elements, let me encourage you to get them before then. As most of you know, our session voted this past week to follow the recommendation of the Executive Committee of the Mission Cabinet of the Presbytery of Carolina, Coastal Carolina to not have any face-to-face -face gatherings, including worship, until May 17th. So we will continue with our online worship at least until that date. And we will keep you updated on when we might be able to again gather together here in our sanctuary. Also, just a reminder that if you are able to do so, I hope you'll continue to support Little Chapel financially. You can send in your offering by mail or if you want to drop it off by the church office. I'm usually here every day, Monday through Friday from 9 until noontime. As become our custom, we want to especially thank Gary Kahunsky for continuing to be our camera person and to David Heinzman for providing us with our inspirational music. And today we have a special guest who will be helping with the music. Tom Sully is going to be playing his clarinet and saxophone in, as part of our worship experience today and we appreciate Tom being here with us. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds as we worship together the risen Christ.
Hear now the words for our call to worship. The Christian life is not so much a destination as a journey. The worship of God is not to be found solely in the gathering of his people in a building, nor in their acts of worship, or even in their faithful service. But true worship is found in sharing the moments wherever we might be when we sense God's presence and in celebrating those moments together with joy. From your den, your living room, your kitchen table, your bedroom, your driveway, let us worship God. And we'll do so this morning by singing our opening hymn, I Come With Joy. between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, 
he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that it, he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, Get up and go on your way, for your faith has made you well. This is God's word for us this morning. say. You don't take a thought already and say, I'm going to go try and find a text that helps me prove what I'm going to say. Well, I'm doing that today. 
I'm using it, this text from the Gospel of Luke because it's the best example I can find about social distancing. And that's ultimately what we're going to talk about this morning. Without a doubt, some of the new buzzwords and phrases for 2020 are social distancing, masks, quarantine, testing, flattening the curve. It's impossible to, to turn on the TV and not have those words or phrases mentioned. It might just be from a commercial where they're talking about the coronavirus in some way, shape, or form. Or maybe the words are on the lips of newscasters or medical scientists or politicians. These words and phrases are part of our new vocabulary. And since the coronavirus has spread across this nation like a race car, the, the concept is that we stay quarantined in our homes and stay at least six feet apart when we do go out. Now, I'm guessing that of all the words and phrases I just mentioned, maybe the most important is, is social distancing. And if you want to know more about that subject than you'll ever care to know, go to Wikipedia. There are over 10 pages devoted to the subject of social distancing. And I'm guessing the next time that Webster's Dictionary prints a new edition, social distancing is going to be listed. It might be more than just a word for a year. It might very well be the word for a generation. Social distancing, however, is not new, and that's why I picked this text this morning. It can be found in various places in both the Old and the New Testament. In our text this morning from the Gospel of Luke, Luke says, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, and here Luke is talking about Jesus, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers. Now right away that number stuck out to me because unless you've been under a rock, you know that in most every state we have been told, limit your gatherings to ten people. And I wondered, is there any biblical idea to that? Or is there, is there any reason why the number ten? So I went back and looked and, and there were a few places where it talked about that for specific diseases, no more than ten people who were sick were allowed to gather together. Did that have any, any bearing on our number 10 today? I don't know, I just found the idea to be interesting. And as we continue to read the text, Luke tells us keeping their distance and calling out to Jesus. Keeping their distance. Again, you all know that the recommendation for social distance is, is six feet. And in biblical times, there seems again to be different distancing requirements depending upon the disease. In his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, Alfred Endersheim reports that the standard practice of the day when he writes these words, no one was to salute a leper and no less than a distance of six feet must be kept from a leper. Or if the wind came from that direction, a hundred feet would scarcely be sufficient. Why did they have to keep their distance? Because they believed that their illness was contagious and that their sneezes and coughs carried germs into the air. Sound familiar? But for us in this day and age, it's hard to social distance. Just look at some of the pictures that you can see on television of what's going on in some of our beaches. We are not really very good at social distancing. It's not something that, that we've yet become comfortable with, if, if we ever will. The leadership of Little Chapel is already starting to think about this whole idea of social distancing once we come back into the sanctuary to worship. What will our services look like? How will we social distance once we are allowed to come back in? Who will you get to sit next to and, and how close will you be able to sit to someone else? What will our worship service look like? Where will it happen? 
questions that we need to think about. Well, it seems to me that that time itself moves in a little different direction when we are social distancing and staying away and staying in isolation. I've had some of you share with me how your days seem to drag on and on and on and on. You see, in normal life, practices and routines are our way of marking time. We get up, we shower, we put on our clothes, we dry our hair, some put on makeup. We do the morning coffee thing as we read the newspaper and then the activities of the day begin. In the middle of the day, we stop and have lunch and some who are more fortunate than others get a chance to take a nap. Then others keep working. And then there's supper and for me, the rituals become watching the evening news. And then there are no, no meetings or any reason to have to come back to church. I spend more time watching television before going to bed. The way that we live, our, our rituals, our practices, they're important to us. Social distancing, quarantining changes all of that. When I first heard back in March that we were going to begin practicing social distancing, I wasn't sure if I was hearing things just right. Why is it that we've all decided that we were to practice social distancing? Why weren't we just going to social distance? Why were we going to practice doing it? For me to, to think about the whole idea of practice meant again routine. Something that I did on a regular basis like spiritual practices of, of prayer and and meditation and devotional time. When I think about spiritual practices, I think about intentional acts, intentional acts whose, whose rewards might not be tangible or immediately apparent, but whose patient, consistent observance eventually produces change. So in that context, maybe practicing is the right word for our distancing. For the practice of social distancing, we must be intentional and we must believe that the change will result in saved lives. It might help us if we can think of social distancing, of, of self-isolation and quarantining as really a type of prayer. For all of us, when we follow the guidelines that have been set for us by the authorities and health professionals in this crisis, in a way, we are practicing love. We are showing solidarity. And in a unique way, we are building relationships. The practice of social distancing should make us aware of how we are living as a part of, of Christ's body in the world, of how we are making the world a, a better place for those who inhabit it. There are a lot of questions that we should be asking ourselves as we practice social distancing and, and maybe some of the questions can help us make the decisions that we have to make. How am I loving someone else by going out or staying home or walking or staying six feet away or moving in close? Could I be loving someone better by staying home? Could I be loving my neighbor better by calling them on Skype or simply talking with them on the phone rather than meeting them at the coffee shop? There is no fear in love. We're told that. We're told for perfect love drives out fear. Reimagining social distancing and isolation as a practice of love, not an action driven by fear, can open our minds to what this new, temporary way of doing community might look like. I don't know about you, but as we have been told to, to not seek out in-person communities, I, I've been wondering a little about my place and, and what is my job? Well, what am I to do while I can't go and visit someone in the nursing home or in the hospital or even in someone's own house? How do any of us love in a time of separation, knowing that God made his home in the world here among us in human flesh? 
How are we to be God's hands and feet in a world in which we must stay six feet away from our neighbor? If we cannot touch the wounds in Jesus' side, if we cannot even share in his last supper together as a community in the same room, how can we be sure that he moves among us at all? My simple answer is that we must believe in God's goodness even if we can't see or touch it. We may never know the impact of how we are living our lives right now, how we are practicing social distancing or staying at home. We don't know how that would impact the nurse who will be able to go home to, to their children and not be in quarantine because we did not affect someone. Or we won't know how our staying at home affects the grocery store clerk who will have one less potential carrier to worry about because we made the decision to stay home. This at least is what I must believe even though I don't completely understand it. But such is the nature of our spiritual practices. When we consider that when we practice social distancing that we are practicing Christ's commandment to love one another, it can make us more conscious of what we do with our time when we are apart. This is, isn't easy to say, but I feel pressured to be productive in a way that I would not have felt two months ago. Instead, what I've done now is try to be a little more intentional about how I spend my time. Time that, that used to be dedicated to sitting in the office or, or visiting with folks in their homes or, or headed to the grocery store or even being out on the golf course. I've spent a lot more time sending and receiving emails than I ever have in my life. I've spent a lot of time texting with folks. I've spent more time than I have ever spent on Facebook scrolling down and, and learning about our church members and what's going on by what they have written. People that I normally see a couple of times a week, I only get to see now on Facebook. I've even spent more time trying to send out handwritten folks to members of our community just to let them know that I'm thinking about them. For I see in the immediate future for us that we are going to have to continue to practice social distancing. But we can do that and continue to practice loving our neighbor all at the same time. The coronavirus outbreak is a time of uncertainty and upheaval for all of us. Loving our neighbor means staying home in order to protect others. It means when you go to the grocery store, staying a few feet further away than you normally would have. Yes, I know we're getting tired of this. We're getting bored. I've been told there are only so many closets to clean out, so many pantries to straighten up, just so many movies to watch on Netflix. But when you think about it, this time can provide us with an unprecedented opportunity to relate with God and to grow spiritually in new and in life-changing ways that we never thought possible. So how about it? Let's not worry so much about our social distancing. Let's not worry so much about our having to stay home and begin to think about how can this time be important to me and to my relationship with God. If we all changed that and made that our focus, my guess is that these times of social distancing will go by a lot faster than we thought. Amen. Our hymn of preparation this morning is In Remembrance of Me.
and Savior. Now, from wherever you are this morning, this is the moment in which we share together as a community of faith, even though we are not in the same room, this supper, a supper that Christ has prepared for us, a supper that Christ has invited us to participate in. The body and blood of Jesus Christ. The body and blood of Jesus Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, you have brought us to this table today as sisters and brothers. Lead us now through each of our moments to that glorious day when all of your children will be able to gather together as family. We make our prayer today in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our peace made flesh. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is God be with you till we meet again. Amen and Amen.